for you guys who are watching the recap, we also cut this out as its own separate video. And so if you're watching just the recap and you want to see our reactions and theories and deep dive discussion, um, even certain moments where we have a theory and then later we get to say we were right, which may happen in today's episode, uh, you can check that out. The link to that full video in the comments below. Um, anyway, Will, you want to take it away? Yeah, I will kick us off. So this is what happened during Campaign 3, Episode 17. Um, and the episode picks up uh, immediately into an Imogen dream sequence. If you recall, at the end of the last episode, she fell asleep while cradling the gem they stole from the Shade Mother. And so we're in her dream. It's the classic Red Storm dream that she's been having over and over. However, this time there's something new. She's holding the gem in the dream, just like she was in real life when she fell asleep. And it is kind of offering her another option you know in this dream she always runs away she can hear her mom screaming at her to run but she looks at the gym and it there's no like it doesn't speak to her or anything but she recognizes that like hey like you can use this to get out of here type of thing um it's not that explicit again but she just feels that like she could attempt to use this gym um to do something here However, she doesn't. She kind of like screams to the ether, like, what is this gym? And, you know, nothing right. responds. And so she ultimately just runs, um, listening to that voice of her mother again and just starts running away and wakes up. Uh, she immediately kind of rustles um, Laudna awake to talk to her and kind of tells her about the dream, tells her about the how the gym was in it. And um, she's like, you know, should I have tried it like she's like i've always just run i've never even tried anything else like i haven't tried to walk toward the storm you know didn't try to use the gym and ladna's like yeah i mean maybe uh do you think you could go back to sleep and like pick up where you left off and you know she says she's not sure but you know as far as tonight she doesn't think she wants to like mess with it anymore so she ends up uh it, it's pretty early in the morning but everyone else is still asleep but imogen decides you know i can't go back to sleep so she walks downstairs and kind of just spends some quiet time in the morning while everyone else you know finishes their rest um and she leaves the gym with laudna in the room and is like hey you know make sure nobody else touches this so she goes downstairs laudna you know kind of puts the gym away uh, a few hours pass and then everyone else wakes up and they been begin to converge downstairs and uh chetney wakes up with a scream because he's so like upset that he overslept through his you know 3 a.m <laughs> date with fern yeah. um <laughs> but everyone gets together kind of catches up and <clears throat> uh imogen actually asks fcg to take a look at this gym now that um he's had a chance to rest and perhaps he can identify it so he looks at it and he comes to find out that this is a shard of the gnarl rock and what the gnarl rock is is this rock from the fey realm and where it resides basically everything around it uh like twists and mutates kind of like nightmarishly and they seemingly have a piece of that rock and uh, they ask fern since she's from the Feywild, you know she recognizes it or knows anything about it um but she is not familiar with it and kind of since they were talking to fern people are like yeah so what what's your story are you from the Feywild? like why are you here how long have you been here and she says that she came here to just explore and kind of see more of the world and her grandma told her that maybe she could try and find her parents um because her parents have been gone and they were originally from the Feywild, but left a long time ago when Fern was really young. I think she says yeah. in her forties. Um, and she doesn't know what they left for, but she has gotten letters from them over the years. And the last place she got one from, uh, was Aeor. So the party's like, okay. And again, catching up, they're kind of roasting Chetney for having fallen asleep and missed the date with Fern. Um, but they're like, okay, so what are we doing? And they're like, okay, we need to go talk to Gianna Hexum and find out more about this job that Ashton told us about. Um, so they decide to do that, but they're also like, well, we need to see Zidana, um, Fern, or sorry, not Fern, um, Laudna and Imogen Laudna want to speak and, to yeah. her. And they also want to go catch up with Estrosh to let them know like what happened with the Green Seekers and the Shade Mother and everything. Um, so first things first, 
they run to Zudana's really quick to check in with her. The girls let her know that, you know, we're going to be out of town for a while, but here's 10 gold, you know, like, please save our room for us. Don't run it to anybody else. And, you know, they just make sure she's okay. Then they head to Gianna's and Ashton basically introduces everyone to her and, you know, tells them that, you know, we're the Bell's Hells, not the nobodies anymore. Um, he's like, everyone here is, you know, on the up and up and better than the nobodies, essentially. Um, <clears throat> Gianna then tells them about the job, and it basically boils down to sh she has this rivalry rivalry with a man known as uh, Ivan Hydroga, and he runs this unique place called the Twilight Museum, which is essentially just a collection of oddities. And uh, you know, Gianna too kind of collects things, and they've argued for years over who has the better collection, and just have had this rivalry. And as we know, Gianna was robbed. And ever since that, uh, well, actually, she wasn't robbed. They didn't take anything, but her place was broken into. And ever since then, she's been getting ribbed by uh, Hydroga, saying, right. like, your defenses are terrible. Like, nobody could ever steal something of mine. And so through that, Born was this um, yeah, this gambit. This, uh, yeah. This, yeah. And he's basically saying, like, I'm going to give an item that I want you to try to steal. And, like, I'm going to prove my defenses cannot be beat. Um so can you do it? And so that's why she's hired the Bell's Hells to try and uh, go steal this item that, again, uh, Hydroga has picked himself. And she lets them know that there may be another crew that is also trying to do this. Um, there is a Mistress Isha Sabanis who is basically another one of their rivals, and she wants to take both Gianna and Hydroga down a peg. So she's going to have yeah. a crew that's trying to do the same thing. And the nuts and the bolts are she's going to pay them 300 gold for travel expenses and everything, and then 500 gold a pop if they're successful, with an additional 500 gold a pop on the table if they're able to sufficiently embarrass uh, Hydroga in the process. <laughs> they're um, going to kill him. <laughs> and then a little note is like there's these little um, like gargoyle busts type statues that like they're blanked face but when somebody gets near it it like morphs to be like a mirror of them and fern like really likes this and she's like if we embarrass them throw in one of those too and she's like i'll think about it yeah. um <laughs> so then uh the 300 gold that they're going to get as travel expenses uh fcg asks can we get that in the form of a single diamond and she says yes and immediately gets them one and yeah, i love how he's like just going through his regent list on his spells <laughs> yeah like, can I get a uh old withered finger <laughs> like uh... so yeah and so now they uh i think well we'll talk about that during the discussion um so they get that and uh she's just like many others have been throughout this campaign, she is taken aback and impressed with FCG, asking right. Ashton, where did you get this automaton? And, um, you know, she's very interested. She wants one of her own. And FCG actually lies and says that Ashton, you know, helped plan and design him, um, you know, because he's so smart and everything. And John is like, well, we'll have to sit down and talk about this once you guys get back from this mission because you know i'm very interested in getting myself an automaton like this and fcg asks, you know just out of curiosity like how much do you think i would be worth and gianna says that you know i just had an automaton stolen from me that was worth twenty thousand gold and you would be worth quite a bit more than that since you are like as advanced as he is right um FCG's like, well, yeah, you guys can just sell me if you ever, if you ever get in trouble yeah. or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so then with all the information and everything, they head out and uh, Gianna wishes them good luck and tells them not to disappoint her. So before they actually head out of town, there are a few final things that they need to take care of. Um, but they decide to split up into three different groups to tackle everything at the same time. So we've got Imogen and Chetney that are going to procure travel horses for the journey. Um, Fern and Laudna are going to go to Estros's and catch him up on everything. And then FCG, Orum, and Ashton are going to go speak with Milo to kind of see if he, uh, see if they might know anything about what's been going on with FCG. So first up, Estros, uh, Fern and Laudna head there, catch him up on everything with the Green Seekers, the Shade Mother, and he asks can the green seekers be trusted? And they tell him that they seem to be trustworthy. Um, 
he then gives them some baked goods uh for the journey tells them to be safe (laughs) and uh also warns them to stick to the trails because it can get quite dangerous out there um next up we uh go to milo Uh, they arrive and tell milo that fcg's been having some issues recently uh milo begins inspecting fcg and notices that there's like this buzzing pent-up energy that perhaps needs to be like released or discharged and milo just says that there's a lot a lot of arcane magical items like have this kind of relationship with energy that you know that needs to either need to recharge or discharge and so perhaps something like that is what's going on with fcg so fcg talks about you know he goes into stasis and maybe that can kind of help with what's going on um but They also say, we're about to go on this mission. Milo, do you have any, like, upgrades for FCG? And no no upgrades per se, but Milo does fix FCG's, like, grappling hook attachments. It was a little, like, wonky, so he went in there and cleaned it, made it all great. And functionally, what this means is Sam can now swap his attachment on his arm without using his entire action. So, pretty nice little upgrade. Yeah. Um. And then finally, we got Chetney and Imogen going to the Rapid Path stables and trying to get some horses. Chetney is pretty disturbed that they don't have sill goats. <laughs> they only have horses. But after a bit of back and forth, they do decide to rent five horses and a small wagon, which they pay 150 gold plus 150 gold deposit that they'll get back upon return <laughs> of the horses. So they're not getting it back. <laughs> yeah, come on. <laughs> <laughs> so then on the way back... Um, Imogen and Chetney are talking and she asks him, you know, red storms, you familiar with that at all? And he says, no, like I've seen some green storms, but never a red one. And she just begins telling him about her dream, the smell of iron and kind of asks him, you know, since you have such a great sense of smell, does this mean anything to you? And, you know, he says iron is the smell of blood. And he says, you know, when people have recurring dreams like this, sometimes it's because it's a memory. And he asks, is this something that maybe happened to you when you were young? And she says, you know, I've never thought of that, but I don't think so. Um, And then real quick, she just asks him about his tattoo, which uh, (laughs) is RTA. And he says that stands for recognize the alpha. You know, everyone's got an alpha inside of them and you just got to learn to assert dominance. (laughs) And then Matt has... Laura roll an intelligence tech (laughs) and basically tells her that, hey, you know, that is a bunch of debunked pseudoscience and nonsense, (laughs) which was just amazing. Yeah, Um, that was great. So all the groups now have reconvened and they're basically outside a general store and they're like, let's get the final supplies, you know, food, water, spell components, et cetera. And uh, Matt's like, just figure out what you want over the break and that will say that you got it. And that's when we went to break. If you want to take it from there. Yeah, and I'll just um, kind of highlight because I really want to be able to talk about this episode. And there's so many like individual things that um, for you guys yeah. who watched it, I'm not going to mention everything, but kind of like the big story points. First of all, Matt does an amazing job of just DMing travel to a location. Um, yeah. I won't really re- recap the exact details of it, but um, in many cases as DMs, we're just kind of like, okay, yeah, you get there. Like anything big happen. <laughs> um, just did a great job doing that. So kind of the big story points that happen on day one, um, first of all, they, as they're traveling, they notice this large dog like rabbit that comes out of the brush and it's holding a pink stone in its mouth and Orem just immediately gets after it. You know, the rabbit's trying to get away. Uh, Matt actually lets um, Liam know that like, hey, you're not going to catch this rabbit just chasing it. And so he tries a more subtle approach of basically like sneaking up on sneaking up on it and also using his druid craft to um, create a carrot to sort of offer to the rabbit. Um, At one point, he does catch up with the rabbit and the rabbit's dropped this pink stone and is kind of like messing in the brush. And Orem, they both roll initiative and Orem has advantage on initiative and actually beats the rabbit and gets to the stone first. Uh, and even Orm's like, why did I just do that? That was so random. <laughs> but they do find out that this pink crystal, which is different from the purple gem that um, Imogen has, which that one's very um, like opaque and cloudy. This is a clear translucent, um, almost like diamond-esque purple gem. Yeah. And they find out that this is a um, Feywild shard. And similar to the Gnarl Rock shard, 
Um, it is something from the Feywilds. And they have this conversation on, it's kind of strange that like we've had so many data points around the Fey or the Feywilds. And they actually even conjecture like, is the Odiran Wilds, like is the Fey sort of seeping into this area? Um, they do talk to um, Fern about it. Fern actually um, does like a, a role to see kind of what she can ascertain from the environment. Rolls a natural one. And it's kind of like, yep, no <laughs> idea. <laughs> but does recall from EXU the time they encountered the gate to the Feywild um, outside of Iman as they were traveling south in Tal'Dorei. And um, there's a lot we'll talk about there in our discussion. But um, Fern also, and really actually in this whole discussion, Fern actually does give some more insight on her journey from the Feywild and mentions that her parents' names are Birdie and Oliander, who goes by Ollie, and that her grandmother, who's been sort of her patron, goes by Morrigan, and that she's essentially looking for her parents, um, like Will mentioned earlier. Uh, they also, FTG cast identify on this um, Feywild shard and finds out that this can attune, it's a magical item that a sorcerer can attune to. And that it allows them anytime they um, roll, um, oh, what was it? Roll their um, um, their meta magic. When they yep. use meta magic, yep. they can choose to roll um, on the wild magic table. And um, also, if that spell on the wild magic table requires concentration, they can cast it without concentration just for the duration of the spell. So Imogen takes that, and it's just a really cool trinket that she picks up. Um, another trinket they find like on this journey is they do find a blue rose. And this is also identified to be um, an item that will give them resistance on lightning damage, up to 10 damage. Or they can use it to do like a cone of lightning damage. But in both cases, the rose is destroyed. Um, so that's another magical item that comes up. And in this time together as they're traveling um not only are they kind of just you know making camp and starting on the day's journey the next day um, but they also get set back with like a rainstorm you know they're kind of just going about and really the remainder of this episode is the moments that they make camp and the two people who are on patrol really just making small talk and talking about like yeah. past history past you know uh, events in their lives and this is where some of like the most interesting reveals happen in the story so far Oram and Ladna on in their patrol um their late night conversation uh they find out um well Oram asks Ladna about her background and Ladna reveals that she was one of the lookalikes from the sun tree that the Briarwoods had used to um, the people that they had hung from the sun tree as a warning to Vox Machina who were, who were entering the city. Um, and it's presumed that she was um, Vex because they had cut her ears to make her look half elven. Um, and so Orm's just like, I'm so sorry. Like um, there's a great moment where she's like, where Orm's like, you know, why are you so positive after everything you've been through? And she's like, well, the worst thing that could ever possibly happen to me has already happened. That's so, a great line amazing moment um just skipping along um other conversations that happen fcg and imogen on one of their patrols uh decide to detect thoughts and go deeper with one another my <laughs> meld yeah they have like this moment where they both like look into each other's past and imogen sees dancer and like sort of like the troop and them having fun and like being around a campfire and like all these great memories and then all of their bodies like laid out and killed and this shadowy figure sort of like moving on. Um, FCG sees the red storm and the intensity of it and all of that, that, that Imogen's experienced. Um, and there's just this really funny moment afterwards of them being like, you're so beautiful. Like, I love you so much. <laughs> yeah. um, and they realized like they were not keeping watch at all. And so <laughs> Matt's like roll initiative, but it's just a joke. Everyone's dead. <laughs> um, Ashton and, uh, I don't remember if it was Ladna or who it was, but Ashton reveals that he wasn't always rock hard, that he was, <laughs> he also like around the age of 10 started to transform into like his earth Genasi esque form. Um, and then Chetney and Oram have a conversation about Chetney mentions that he only became uh, a lycanthrope 
in the past few months, this is a relatively new thing for him. And Orem reveals that something we had conjectured in EXU, that the reason he's on this mission is because that day when the voice of the Tempest was attacked, his husband, Will, who was also one of the guards, uh, was killed in the attack. And he has a tattoo um, of the two moons as a reminder of the time that they shared. Um, and Jenny realizes this is a really personal mission for you. So um, I think that's mostly the conversations that happen. I don't know if I missed one or not, but um, I think that did was, I miss one. I don't think so. Okay. The episode basically ends with the party seeing this floating fairy and they have all these conversations on like, hi, hello, are you there? <laughs> and it's really unresponsive. And they decide even as it's pulling away, they decide, you know, we got to follow this thing. And it pulls away to reveal itself as a kind of like the angler fish, a lure of a giant vine like snapping creature. Yeah. Um, and that's where the session ends. And that's what happened on episode 17 of campaign three of critical role.